Thank you very much, Jackie. And it's a real privilege to be asked to um, speak with you all this evening and to refre reflect on leading through crisis. I want to really begin by going back to a time just before the pandemic struck when in January last year, we were facing a crisis in workforce across the UK, which was probably as great as any we'd faced in the history of the NHS across the four UK nations. There were large numbers of vacancies among staff across the NHS and levels of stress were at an all time high. We also were seeing very high levels of sickness absence in Scotland, it was running at about 5.3% and very high levels of vacancies amongst GPs, nurses, midwives. And in Scotland, around 26% of GPs were saying that they planned to quit general practice within the next five years. We were also seeing across the UK, one in four nurses leaving the NHS within three years of joining. We were facing a triple, um, if you like, hit from very high rates of sickness absence, very high rates of staff turnover and intention to quit, um, and very high levels of uh, vacancies, all indicators of organizational health. And then the pandemic struck with the increases in stress and anxiety and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder among staff. And back in September in Scotland, the Everyone Matters Pulse Survey showed that around 26% of staff were reporting being highly anxious at that time and 47% either highly anxious or moderately anxious. And so I think it's really important that when we're thinking about leading through crisis at the minute, that we think not just about recovery in the short term from when we come through this crisis, but that we have a longer term perspective how we renew or transform our health services so that we, in order to create situations where we can deliver high quality, continually improving and compassionate care for patients and service users, we recognize that we must also provide high quality, continually improving and compassionate support for staff, the staff who deliver health and care services. So I think we need a long-term strategy going forwards and that that first and foremost needs to draw upon our knowledge of what has happened during this last 11 months to a year. And I think the key lesson that's emerged is the importance of compassion to all of us. The compassion that health and care staff have shown to patients and service users, extraordinarily moving stories, the compassion that colleagues have shown to each other, the cups of tea, the hugs, the checking in, checking in on each other, the compassion that those in the community have shown to, for example, elderly people living alone. And that compassion during this time of fear, uncertainty and tragedy has held us because compassion is how we create a sense of connection and the sense of belonging that meets that core need of humanity to feel close and cared for by others. After all, we're as likely to die from the effects of loneliness as we are from the effects of, of smoking or from obesity. Compassion means four things. If I'm to show to compassion to somebody in distress or pain or fear, then first I have to be present with them and give them my attention to listen with fascination. Second, I have to understand the causes of their distress through having a dialogue with them. Third, I have to empathize with them to feel their distress or pain or fear without being overwhelmed by it, because that gives me the motivation for the fourth element of compassion, which is helping or serving the other person. And we know that compassion is really important in healthcare. Across the board, as the review by two American medics, Treziak and Mazzarelli, showed in 2019, it's probably the most important intervention there is across the board in healthcare. And so the challenge for us going forward is how we create cultures of compassion 
in our health and care organizations, cultures where people will be compassionate towards those they're providing care for, where they'll be compassionate towards colleagues, and where all interactions have within them the hue, if you like, the color of compassion, because it's so fundamental in human behavior. How do we, do, how do we achieve that going forward? Well, every interaction by every one of us every day in our work organizations is an opportunity to shape the culture of our organizations. How warm we are, how kind we are, how irritable we are, how cynical we are, how compassionate we are. But the role of leaders is particularly powerful. What leaders pay attention to, what they talk about, what they reward, what they model in their own behaviors tells us what it is that they value. So leaders must model compassion in their leadership if we are to create cultures of high quality, compassionate care. That means leaders paying attention to those they need, listening with fascination. Leaders seeking to understand the challenges that those they lead face. Leaders who empathize with those they lead, who feel for them and with them. And leaders who help those they lead to do the jobs that they want to do, which means leaders Remove, helping to remove the obstacles that get in the way or helping and or helping by ensuring that people have the right resources, the right numbers of staff, the right technologies, the right equipment, the right training that they need to do their jobs effectively. And it's no coincidence that these four behaviors that we've known for 60 or 70 years are the key behaviors of effective leadership in any setting it's no coincidence that they are the same behaviors that constitute compassion, because they're behaviors that enable us to connect with each other, to feel a sense of belonging, to, to blur the boundaries between self and other. And we know that these behaviors are associated with the organizational outcomes that matter to us. So we know that when leaders behave this way across an organization in health and care, that that's associated subsequently with high quality care as rated externally, with higher levels of patient satisfaction, with better financial performance, and in the, in the acute sector with lower levels of patient mortality. But in order to lead compassionately in the future, what we have to do is also to understand what are the core needs of those we lead in the workplace. So the two inquiries that Jackie uh, mentioned that I was fortunate to be a part of into the mental health and well-being of doctors and nurses and midwives across the UK took as a model for, a, for the inquiry, uh, a model called self-determination theory developed by DC and Ryan in the United States, which has identified what the core needs of people are in the workplace. And those core needs we called in both inquiry, inquiries the ABC of core needs. And what they tell us is people have these three core needs that must be satisfied, all of them, in order for people to be well at work, to have good mental health, not to be so stressed, not to be intending to quit, and also to be highly intrinsically motivated. And we call, call these the ABC of core needs at work. And it refers to the three needs that people have. First of all, to um, have a sense of control over their lives, a sense of autonomy where they feel they have voice and influence and where they're able to act in a way that's consistent with their values. Second is the importance of having a sense of belonging that I've referred to already, the sense that we work in teams where we care for our colleagues and they care for us. Uh, where we work in organizations where we're appreciated, valued, respected, supported. And the importance also of having our needs for contribution or competence met, that we feel through our work that we can deliver the quality of care that we feel we should be delivering, where we feel a sense of effectiveness. And in the future, in order to ensure mental health and well-being of NHS staff and to ensure their intrinsic motivation so that they experience joy at work rather than just an ending exhaustion or frustration or, or anger, we have to ensure that we're focused on meeting these core needs. 
And we do that by making sure that everybody's voice is heard, that we're giving all groups of staff a sense of influence over their work, um, a, a sense that they work in just and fair culture cultures, which aren't characterized by discrimination, and where the basic working conditions give people a sense of strong control. Northumbria NHS Trust during the pandemic has created a Facebook page so they can hear the voices of all staff. They do regular pulse surveys to see which groups of staff within the organization are feeling under pressure so they can go and intervene and provide support. We've seen how NHS Dumfries and Galloway provided um, comfort boxes in their campaign to support staff. And Northumbria, as I mentioned, they provided free food at night for staff, free parking, and in some cases where necessary, free accommodation. And so it's how we create that sense of control and autonomy and influence for, for staff. And also how we build that sense of belonging in the future. And we know that working in teams is profoundly important for the quality of health and care that we deliver and also the mental health and well-being of staff. And we need to build team working back better after the pandemic, where everybody is a member of a, if you like, a home team, where they get their social support, do their quality improvement projects, get their learning. And we've seen good examples of um, some of that fourth Valley developed care home assessment and response multidisciplinary teams to support the care home sector during the pandemic. And in terms of contribution or competence, it's vital that we address the issue of chronic work overload. It's the number one predictor of staff stress, the number one predictor of staff in intention to quit. It was what GPs in Scotland said was the main factor in determining their uh, intent to quit. Um, and it's also highly associated with patient dissatisfaction. So we have to address the issue of chronic work overload because of its impact on staff health as well, and also errors in uh, clinical practice. Uh, East London Foundation Trust has eliminated 85% of clinical audit activities in consultation with its staff in the context of its quality improvement culture, and regularly asks staff what activities they would reduce or get rid of. It's about developing more flexible team working and working across boundaries more effectively. I was in, really impressed by the dental services team in Ayrshire and Aran, where general uh, dental practice and uh, public dental services combined to provide integrated services during the course of the pandemic, breaking down boundaries and finding new ways of working together. Or the example of the NHS Louisa Jordan that was developed in, in a very short space of time by people working across boundaries and across sectors to achieve extraordinary things. And, and it's about using new technologies so we can relieve chronic work overload, uh, as I said more, versatile and flexible multidisciplinary team working and working more with the community in the future. We've seen amazing examples of how the community has taken responsibility for supporting health healthcare services, not just as volunteers, but as making sure that community groups are uh, liaising with health services to ensure that we're delivering high quality care. We've got amazing exa examples across the UK, the Wigan deal, the Bromley by Bow practice in London, the Well Together practice, and great examples further afield, the NUCA system in South Central Alaska, the Montefiore system in New York, and so on. And these examples can be found, for example, on the King's Fund website. So the future, I think, is about ensuring that our leadership is primarily focused on meeting these core needs of staff in order that they are well and motivated to deliver high quality care. And it's about how we create overall psychological safety for those that we lead um, in our organizations, ensuring that there is compassionate leadership and great team working, as I've said, in a context where we have the clear direction of clear vision and values and, and goals, where we're focused on making sure that people are working 
in climates not of fear and blame, but of reflection and learning and innovation. And where we're facilitating frequent contact, that's what leaders must do, is to have frequent positive contact with those they lead. And we have to, in the future, value diversity and difference, whether it's diversity in terms of professional background, the teams we work with, the organizations we work with, and approach conflict so that we manage it in a positive, ethical, transparent way, because that promotes innovation and also creates a sense of psychological safety. And it's about building cultures and climates of mutual support and compassion and leadership humility, the humility to ask for feedback, to, uh, to recognize when we don't know uh, what to do and to, and to seek support. NHS Ayrshire and Aaron has done really good work around developing psychological safety and in particular working with the acute services pediatric team to achieve much greater psychological safety. So the point is, there are lots of places that are already doing these things well that we all can learn from. And it is an integrated, comprehensive strategy, I think we need, of not just recovery, but renewal and transformation for the future. The most important thing, I think, for all clinicians and leaders is that going forward, we must also, I think, have the courage to, first of all, be self-compassionate. Because when we're self in the moment and pay attention to ourselves, we are better leaders because we're in tune with what's happening for us at the moment. And that enables us to be in tune with those we lead and those we provide care for. It's about understanding the challenges we face in our work and in our lives generally, and having a, the courage to be caring and empathic towards ourselves. Because we're as worthy of care and support and compassion as any other human being on the planet. And that also gives us the motivation then to intelligently take care of ourselves so we can be the best leaders, clinicians we can be, so we can be happy. Um, and through being self-compassionate, we, we connect more deeply with ourselves and are in touch more with our core values like wisdom, compassion and courage. And that enables us then to have deeper and more authentic connections with all of those we need and indeed all of those we interact with. So all of this, I think, this, this recovery and renewal begins with us having the courage to be self-compassionate. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. As always, a very um, powerful and, and persuasive discussion about, about compassionate leadership in, in particular. Um, we've got time for a few questions, and there are, there are quite a few questions in the chat bar that I will try and, and work my way through. Um, just in opening, you know, the, the understanding that actually this form of uh, leading through change actually does result in better performance. Sometimes it feels, I think, as though there's quite a big gulf within some of the health boards between what um, they can see from the perspective of the, of the work that you've done and the performance that they feel they're trying to deliver. It feels as if there's, there's quite a gulf between those two things. How do you think we get over some of those um, hurdles, barriers to, to achieving that kind of, of leadership? So I, I think it's a really important question. I'm often, you know, people often say, well, we think some of our top leaders are have to get this, but we've got a problem about it being implemented across the board. And, and I think it's about having the courage to be persistent. Culture change takes time. It doesn't take forever, but it takes time and it takes persistence. Uh, a, Health Education and Improvement Wales, the national body, is with the support of the minister implementing a 10 year strategy to develop compassionate leadership across the whole of health and social care in Wales. And I've been developing materials with them, which they want to make available to all four UK nations. Um, and it's also about making sure that we are building this into the genetic structure of our organization. So we are selecting people on the basis of a value of compassion, developing um, uh, medics in training on the basis of of compassion. In 17 out of 18 studies, we see compassion declines during medical training. Yet 
clinician compassion is associated with the clinician's own well-being as well. So it's about really developing compassion in all our processes, appraisals, performance management, team working, um, and education, so that we build this into the genetic structure of our organizations. Okay, thank you. Um, a question about what should one do when it's the manager who's burnt out or under pressure and, and stressed and isn't coping or working well? Yeah, so compassion, I think, is, uh, of course, uh, multi-directional. And it's our responsibility as team members to support each other and to support team leaders and to show that compassion and encourage self-compassion. Um, I think what's really important is that teams take the time regularly to meet. Teams should be meeting, if not daily, at least weekly, to review what they're trying to achieve, how they're going about it and how things are, and, and to check in on each other. And it's the collective responsibility of team members to provide support for their leaders as well. And those weekly or daily meetings are an opportunity to reflect and, and raise issues. And we know that teams that do that, whether it's you know ward teams for 15 minutes at the end of the working day or um, community mental health teams meeting fortnightly for half a day to review what we're trying to achieve and how we're going about it are much more productive, dramatically so, much more innovative, and they're better at caring for the mental health of all team members, including the team leader. Thanks, Michael. Um, though, though, there are many more questions. We'll try, if we can, to come back to some of those at the end of the session. But for now, can I thank you? And we'll, we'll move on um, in our programme.